We're not going to read the entire chapter. You could do that later. We're going to read most of it, though. We start reading in verse number 1. The Bible reads, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And, and the, the focus of my message this morning and of the topic is going to be regarding salvation. Now, I'm not, we don't, we're not the type of church that preaches on salvation every week. You know, there's a lot of churches out there that will just do the same thing over and over again. But I realized that I preached a sermon about one or two weeks ago on the, the false doctrine that states that you have to repent of your sins in order to be saved. Now, I'm sure we've all heard this before, but a lot of people haven't really given it much thought. And I'm not going to re-preach that entire sermon. If you're saying, wait a minute, what are you talking about? I'll get you a CD. It's online. It's on YouTube. You can see the sermon I just preached about a week or two ago. But um, essentially, and this is why we're learning Jonah chapter 3, just so I don't leave you hanging there if you're here for the first time, you never heard this before. Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, the Bible reads, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So the Bible very clearly defines turning from your wicked ways or turning from your sins as being a work. It's a works. So if we have to turn from our wicked ways, if we have to turn from our sins in order to receive salvation, then very clearly from the Bible, it's defining a works-based salvation. But the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. Our salvation comes strictly by putting our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And, you know, when you preach on things like this, though, it has a tendency to offend some people. People get all, all upset about it, but the bottom line is we need to decide what does the Bible teach and what does it say. And again, if you want to see all the evidence for that, I'm not going to re-preach it. There's tons of evidence in the Bible that, that shows that the one thing that we must do to be saved is put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. It has nothing to do with turning away from bad works. Now, should we turn away from our sins? Of course we should. But that is not what saves you. It's not a part of the salvation equation. But I'm going to continue on here a little bit and just make sure that we're very clear about what we believe here, especially when it comes to salvation, because there's some confusion about some of these issues. And, and there's so many people that teach contrary, and so many people have been corrupting the Word of God and have been perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ and been continually trying to add works and add works. And as it was all the way back in the time of Jesus, it still is today. They were trying to say, well, you have to keep some of Moses' laws. Well, you've got to be circumcised. Well, you got, you know, and, and these were the issues that were coming up in his time. And Apostle Paul saying, no, it's faith, it's belief. It's, you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to keep some of the law. It's faith. That's what gets you saved. And, and it, was, it was kind of a big struggle back then because a lot of people were having a hard time grasping that. But um, what the Bible says here, and in verse number 3, I stopped reading there, it says that we are begot, He's begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead proves who Jesus was. He fulfilled prophecy. But it also gives us a hope because the fact that Jesus Christ physically rose again from the dead, came back to life, proves our resurrection because there is going to be a resurrection of the just and of the unjust. And there's going to be a resurrection that we are going to, when we're going to receive a new body. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more. But um, just to lay the groundwork here, there's a hope. And we're born again. That's what it means by begotten. He's begotten us again. We're born again. And we're born again. We become a child of God. We're going to keep reading here. Look at verse number four. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And the main focus of my, my sermon this morning 
is, is going to be on the subject of not being able to lose your salvation at all. It's impossible to lose your salvation in that we're born of incorruptible seed. Amen. It's impossible because, and see here's in verse number five, he's saying we're kept by the power of God. Once you're saved, once you're born again, God is the one that's keeping you. So even if a person might sin, even if a person gets into some, some sins or whatever the case may be, you can't say, well, that person's not saved because they're sinning because they're kept by the power of God. Even if you go out and sin, you're kept by the power of God, says, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. And then it goes on. Let's jump down to verse number 17, because this is really the text I wanted to pull from in this chapter. Verse number 17. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know, that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He's saying you were redeemed. God has redeemed you. We were in sins and transgressions and we, pay, we owed a debt of hell. But God has redeemed us. God has saved us from the judgment to come, from hell. He saved us, how? Through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Precious means it's pricey. It's very expensive. The precious blood of Jesus Christ was able to pay for your souls. He's redeemed you. He's bought you with a price. You belong to God. Amen. And of course, Christ was without blemish, without spot, without sin. And that's going to be important. I get in here a little bit. Look at verse number 20. We're going to keep reading. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. And back up there to verse number 23, he says, being born again. See, we're born again, not of corruptible seed. It's not of some corruptible seed. It's not, it's not something that, that can die and go away. The seed that we are born again from is incorruptible. It cannot be corrupted. It cannot die. It cannot, you know, it, it says it's, it, it's going to live and abides forever. The Word of God lives and abides forever. And this is just a little precursor to November 20th Bible Sunday. The Word of God lives and abides forever. Incorruptible. Amen. Perfect. Complete. But that Word, that same Word, that Word of God is what brings that seed into a person's heart that you need to receive, that you need to believe on in order to have new life, in order for that new creature to be born, in order to be born again, to get that new spirit. And that spirit is born of an incorruptible seed. It's perfect. Our flesh is born of corruptible flesh. When we're born into this world, we have a mother and a father, and they're sinners. And there's a sin nature that we're born into when we're born the first time. But the second birth is a spiritual birth. The second birth is born of an incorruptible seed. It comes straight from the Word of God. And, you know, it's interesting, of course, what is the Word of God anyways? The Bible says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. The Word of God is also referring to Jesus Christ. The Word of God is the written Word of God. 
Jesus Christ is called the Word of God. He was the Word made flesh. Jesus Christ embodies, and that's, you know, try to wrap your mind around that. It's an amazing thing, but it, the, the Bible doesn't use the name the Word uh, for no reason at all. Obviously, it has a meaning. It's referring to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ embodies all of God's Word, the whole Bible. He is the embodiment in, in the physical, the, the, the spiritual uh, representation and being living out God's Word. Right. And just as much as Jesus Christ was without spot and without blemish, God's word is without spot and without blemish. And we need, just as much as we need Jesus Christ for our salvation, we need the word of God for our salvation. Romans 10 says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Our faith comes when we hear God's word and God's word gets sown into our hearts. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter number 8. And just going along that same line of the Word of God being that seed in, in Luke 8 is one of the examples in the Gospel of the, of the parable of the sower. And when Jesus Christ is explaining the parable of the sower, He says, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Right? Talking about heaven, the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. And he talks about the sower that goes across, he's sowing the word of God. He's sowing the seed and it falls on stony places and some on good ground and some by the wayside. You know, he explains what all that means. We're not going to go through that this morning, but there's just these various examples I just want to throw out there that you understand that our faith comes by hearing, by hearing the word of God. The word of God is incorruptible. It's the incorruptible seed that brings forth the new life. In Romans chapter 8, we're going to go through quite a bit of this. We're going to start reading in verse number 7. Now, there's many places in the Bible that refers to you being in Christ or Christ being in you. Christ in you is the reason you have everlasting life and not temporary life. So a lot of people will throw around the term, you know, well, I, I, you know, when I got saved, I asked Jesus into my heart. Now, it's not the worst term, okay? It's, a, it's not like I have some huge issue with that. It's not necessarily exactly what the Bible says, but it is kind of what happens. I mean, when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ... You know, you're born again of that incorruptible seed and you also have the Holy Ghost dwelling inside of you. So you're asking Jesus into your heart. You know, it's not, it's not some horrible expression, but the reason why Jesus is without spot, Jesus is without blemish, Jesus is everlasting, Jesus has everlasting life, we get everlasting life through him. Amen. Like by proxy. I mean, we get converted of our sins, but when he comes in our hearts, that's everlasting. That's eternal. We have that forever. And it's not because of our own righteousness, because we don't have it. Our righteousnesses are like filthy rags in God's sight. But Jesus did everything right. Jesus said, I do always those things that please the Father. Everything he did. Not only did he not sin, but he also did absolutely everything he was supposed to do. There's two types of sins. There's sins of commission and sins of omission. Sins of commission are the ones that we commit a sin. We actually do something we're not supposed to do, something we're prohibited from doing. When we go out and get drunk, when you go out and, and, and you know, lust with your eyes on something, you know, when you do things that are sins, when you steal, those are breaking God's commandments. But you know there's also sins when he says, go ye out therefore and preach the gospel to every creature, and you don't do it. And you withhold yourself from doing that which is right. He says when you see your brother, you know, destitute and naked, without clothing and without food, and he says, go ye and be warmed and filled, like it says in James chapter 2, you know, you're not doing them any good either. You know, we're supposed to love our brother as ourselves. We're supposed to be doing things actively that is in obedience to God's word, not just not breaking the laws. Jesus did both of those things. He kept all the laws. He didn't break any of them. But he also went out and loved his neighbors himself. And he loved us so much that he gave his own life for us. Amen. That's the love wherewith he loved us. Amen. And we're supposed to love others the way Christ loved us. So it's, uh, <laughs> we're supposed to do what he... I mean, we can't do it, but we're, that's, that's the goal. That's the mark. He's the standard. He did it all. But the righteousness that Jesus did gets imputed unto us. And again, it's everlasting. He, he is everlasting. When we receive Him, we receive Christ. 
and we receive everlasting or eternal life. Let us start reading in Romans chapter 8, verse number 7. Romans 8, 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. And carnal just means fleshly. It's, a, you know, it's of our body. It's an enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The carnal mind, the fleshly mind, our flesh body that we have right now, it's at odds with God. It's an enmity with God. Our flesh, it says it's not subject to the law of God, neither can be. Our flesh is, cannot be subject to the law of God. It, it has its own will, its own mind to do evil, to do wrong. And this is why, and this is important to get this, this is why you can be saved and still sin. We're all sinners. Jesus Christ gives us the atonement for our sins. Jesus Christ gives us eternal life as a free gift. Jesus Christ comes and dwells inside of us. But the flesh, as long as we remain in this flesh, we will still have sin. We will still be sinners. We will still do that which is wrong. And we're going to go on and continue with this chapter. This chapter does a great job of explaining this concept. Verse 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're walking in the flesh, you're not pleasing God at all. Verse 9, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, again, this is defining the terms because the use of the words walking in the flesh, walking in the spirit in different ways in different sections of the Bible. So I'm important to get in context right here is saying you are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. If you're born again, you've got the Spirit of God dwelling in you, then you are not in the flesh. For, this, for the context of what we're talking about here. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you're not born again, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you aren't it. You're not, you're not a child of God. You're none of his. You have nothing to do with him. Verse 10, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And again, this is important in understanding the concept of eternal life, that it truly is forever because it's all about the spirit. It has nothing to do with your flesh. The flesh can't please God anyway, so it has nothing to do whether or not whatever you're doing in your flesh, you know, your flesh is going to cause you to sin. The spirit, if you have Christ, if you have the spirit, you are born again. You have eternal life life. Verse 11, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the, the body, ye shall live. And that's talking about physical death. Physically, you know, if you're, not, if you're going to live after the flesh, you're going to die. If you just continue to just go and live a life of sin, you're going to die. But if you, through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. And it says there we're debtors. Of course we're debtors because our debt has been paid for. Right. So we should not go. Be, you know, Jesus Christ paid because of the results of us living in the flesh. Because of the results of our fleshly actions, our fleshly sins, he paid for all that. So we owe him. I mean, we're debtors to him. He paid the whole way. So we shouldn't just go and continue in the flesh since he already paid for that. We need to be walking in the Spirit. Look at verse number 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now, the Bible, I believe, uses many um, references and explanations of, of deeper concepts in ways that we could understand. For example, when the Bible calls, uh, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The concept of a gift, we understand that. 
We, 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 you know, people give and receive gifts all the time. We, we understand the concept that a gift cannot be a gift if you're charging for it, right? If I say, I want to give you this gift, but you got to give me a dollar, that's not a gift. We know that's not a gift. That's a sale. We know that, that a gift has to be free of works. If I were to say, hey, I want to give you this, this Bible as a gift, but you got to go out and, and wash my car and clean my house. Well, that's not a gift. You're earning it. You're working for it. We, we get these concepts. They're basic concepts. They're simple. And these are the types of things that I love to use at the door or in any situation when I'm trying to give the gospel to somebody because we get these concepts and the Bible uses these types of words on purpose so that we can understand it. The Bible uses terms of being born again, being children of God, whereby we cry you know, unto God, Abba, Father. Because we understand that relationship. We understand that when you're born into a family, you've got one birth. You're born in that family and you can't change that once you're born into that family. You can't change who your parents are. Your parents can't change who you are, they lead you and guide you and try to direct you. But once you're born into a family, you cannot be unborn. It's impossible. And it's the same way with eternal life. When you're born again, when you put your faith in Christ, you become a child of God. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. When we believe on the name of Jesus Christ, we become a son of God. We are born into God's family. Our spirit is born again. We're born into God's family. He becomes our father and we become his children. In the same way that any loving father is going to discipline his children when they break their commandments, God will do that to us. But the same way that no loving father is going to throw his child in the oven and turn it on broil and leave him in there forever, our heavenly loving father isn't going to do that to his children either by casting them into hell. It's not going to happen. It's, 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 it's all, and that punishment has already been bought and paid for through Jesus Christ. That is done. It doesn't mean he just says, okay, we'll just go and do whatever you want and there's no consequences for it. That's ridiculous. The Bible says you're going to reap what you sow. You sow to the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind. That's a fact. That's a true statement. That goes for believers and unbelievers. But once you're born into the family and God's your father, you can't be unborn. And it says here, and if children, then heirs. And see, that's a good thing about an inheritance, being an heir. That's not based on your works. It's based on your genealogy. It's based on who your predecessor is. You know, the, the heir is like, my father will leave things to me as an inheritance because I'm his heir, because I was directly descended from him. No other virtue than that. It's just, I'm his descendant. So because of that, I'm an heir. And with God, it's the same way. Now, because we've become adopted children because we become born again we are now heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ the son of God the, son, the only begotten of the father son of God born in the flesh here Jesus Christ because he's in us we are now joint heirs with him Let's keep reading here at verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs of with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. So he's going on to say there, and you know, there's kind of a lot going on here in those verses 19 through 23. The earnest expectation of the creature. The creature is just the creation, right? What God made. The expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. See, when you're born again, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, your salvation isn't complete. 
Now, let me be clear about that. What, you've, what you have needed to do in order to be saved is complete. Putting your faith on Jesus Christ, once you do that, that is complete. But see, the whole, the whole salvation of our body and soul and spirit is not complete. Because even though your, your, your spirit is born again, you have a new creature, your body is still in the flesh. You still have this fleshly, wicked body. But we will be getting a new body. Our body is going to be transformed. It's going to be changed. If you would, please turn to 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to see uh, you know, a, a passage here talking about that transformation of our body. Because as long as we're in this flesh, our salvation is not complete. We still are waiting to receive that new body. <clears throat> waiting for the adoption is what it's calling, it's referring to that as the redemption of our body. We have our, our soul's been redeemed, but the body has not been redeemed yet. But it's coming, and there's a hope, and there's a promise of that. That's why when we saw Jesus Christ's resurrection and Him and His glorified body, we know that that's coming for us too. We know that that's going to happen at the resurrection. Verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Near the end of the chapter there. Verse 51. The end result of the new birth from the incorruptible seed. Remember that the word of God is the incorruptible seed. We got our new life. We got our new spiritual birth is also an incorruptible flesh. Uh, verse 51, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. There's that word again, incorruptible, right? There's the incorruptible seed of word of God. That incorruptible seed planted inside of us, sown in our hearts, bringing forth life. We're going to be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed. Verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. While our spirit is immortal, yes, our body is not. Yet, we still have mortal flesh. That's why we still die. That's why people physically die because their flesh dies. But once we receive the incorruptible flesh and it's transformed, there is no more death. Amen. The last enemy defeated is death. Amen. And that's coming. Verse 54, So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, through the incorruptible word. The incorruptible word is going to bring forth an incorruptible flesh. In the meantime, we still have the corruptible flesh. Um, we have confidence that our flesh will be changed. Philippians 1.6, you don't have to turn there. You can turn to Ephesians chapter 1 if you would. Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. When you got saved, God has begun a good work in you. By giving you life, by giving you that new creature, that new spirit that's born inside of you. That is a work that starts. And the Bible says here, and if we believe the Bible, we can believe that He will perform it. Nothing's going to get in the way of God performing that work until the day of Jesus Christ when we're finally complete. Right now, we're still incomplete. We're complete through Jesus Christ, but in, in, our, in our standing in time right now, our body is not complete yet. Our salvation is not really complete. It's just a matter of time before it becomes complete. Ephesians chapter 1, and this is a verse that we actually have on our invitations that we pass out, because again, this is a very important concept, and we're trying to be clear on the fact that once you're saved, you are saved forever. You are saved eternally. And no amount of sin that a person does can prevent them from going to heaven once they've already been saved. It's an indication of them walking in their flesh. 
But it's, it does not mean they're not saved. Look at verse number 13. The Bible reads, well, it's verse number 12. That we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvations, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. The Bible says that when we received, when we heard the gospel, and then believed the gospel, we were sealed. God put a seal on us. We're sealed with His Holy Spirit of promise. God made a promise. The Bible says in Titus 1, 2, in, in hope of eternal life, that, uh, that he which cannot lie promised before the world began. It's a hope of eternal life. Eternal means forever. God made a promise. He cannot lie. He sealed us with that promise. And not only that, it says that we've, um, that spirit that he sealed us with, it's the earnest. So if, you ever, if, if, if you're, you know, it's a term that's not used very much today except in like home buying. When you go to buy a house, you have to put down earnest money. The earnest money means that you are very serious about making that purchase at a certain percentage. You got to put down, you know, $5,000, you know, a certain amount where they're going to say, you know, you didn't pay the whole amount yet and you're going forward with the transaction, but it's showing them that, you know, I'm not just talking here. This is for real. We're going to go through and do this. And the reason being is that you just lose that, you know, if you, if you decide to back out and buying a house, once you've already put the earnest money down, you don't get a refund on that. That's money that's just gone. And people don't want to lose that money, which is you know, why they do that, to, to, to make sure that you're going to go through with what you say you're going to do. Because you're saying you're going to purchase the house. Well, when God makes a promise, we know that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. And on top of that, he's put an earnest on us. The earnest of the spirit of promise that, that he's given to us. That is the earnest of our inheritance the Bible says, that we are going to inherit from God until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. Turn back, if you would, uh, just a couple pages to Galatians chapter 5. This is how we can still sin, even grievous sins. Even if someone does something, you know, pretty bad, like King David did when he commit adultery and murder, but still be saved. David was saved. David was saved by believing, just like Abraham was. But I was in Romans 4, and, um, that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. It says, But to him that worketh is reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And that's the way it always was. The Bible says that, that that's what it was with Abraham. Even David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom the Lord will not impute sin. David knew that. David knows that there's, there are people that God will not impute their sins to them. Why? Because they've been saved by grace. They've been saved by putting their faith in the Lord. Galatians 5 verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that ye would. And again, keep in mind that word will and would. It's your intent. It's what you want to do. We kind of use those words today as like should or am going to do. Like, but, but the words will and would. So he says at the end of verse 17, so you cannot do the things that ye would it means that you want to do. That you can't do the things that you really want to do. You can't do that when you're walking in the flesh because the flesh is contrary to your spirit. You're born again, that spirit, the spirit is what's driving you to do what's right. The spirit is telling you, hey, let's serve God. Hey, let's read the Bible. Hey, let's pray. Let's do all these good things. That new spirit that's born of the incorruptible seed is, is pushing you in that direction saying, let's do this good stuff. But your flesh is the exact opposite. It's saying, no, I want to sleep. No, I want to go get drunk. No, I want to go, you know, look at things. I don't want to be like, whatever the case may be. Your flesh is driving you. This is the contrary. So you have this daily battle and this daily struggle. 
This daily struggle is not a struggle for your salvation. It's a struggle because of your salvation. The struggle is even there to begin with because now you've got the Spirit. Before you got saved, you didn't have that new Spirit. And you cannot please God until you're born again. Do you believe that He is God? Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 7. But this is the explanation. This is what we need to understand of how a person can be saved and still commit sins. Because a lot of people try to point to that and say, oh, you know, you people that believe in eternal security, you believe that once saved, always saved. What about these people who are still sinning and all this other stuff? Look, God knows their heart, first of all. I don't know their heart. I mean, if I see somebody that's just living a full life of sin, it may be a wise thing for me to assume that they're not saved. And the reason being is because if I'm thinking that, then I'm going to try to give them the gospel. Because that's what I should do anyways. Now, if they are saved, what damage or hurt does it do to give them the gospel? Nothing. Great, they're saved. Right? But if, they, if they're not saved, then maybe they'll get saved. Right? Maybe they'll, but the thing is, you cannot just say that a person, you know, you can't just say, well, if they're not doing good things, then they're not saved. Because they could just be walking in their flesh. We have a two parts right now with the spirit and the flesh. The spirit's going to do what's right. The flesh is going to do what's wrong. And depending on which one you are walking in in any particular moment is what you're going to be doing. If you're walking in the spirit, you can't be in the flesh. And if you're walking in the flesh, you can't be in the spirit. The two are completely exclusive of each other. It's one or the other. It's hot and cold. There is no middle ground of I'm kind of in the spirit and kind of in the flesh. It's one or the other. You're doing what's right or you're not doing what's right. Amen. And if we examine ourselves, you'll probably find that more often than not, you're walking in the flesh and not in the spirit. Did I have you turn to Romans 7? Yes. Romans 7, we're going to start reading in verse number 1. This is a critical passage. We're almost done, sort of. Romans 7. Look at verse number 1. Know ye not, brethren? For I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. And again, the law is the reason why we even sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. That's what sin is. God said not to do it. We do it. That's a sin. So explaining here. Look, I'm speaking to them that know the law. That's who he's talking to here. The law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from, the law, from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren... Ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And before I go any further, again, he's using an illustration. He's using an example of saying, you know what? When two people get married, a man and a woman, they make vows to each other till death do us part. Right? Right? That's your vow. And the Bible says, you know, what God hath joined together, let not man divide asunder. No, man, man shouldn't be breaking apart those marriages. And he says, because your marriage is supposed to be until death. When people get divorced and remarried, there's still that law saying she's going to be called an adulteress because... That first husband, that's not really broken there. And again, I'm not going to get too far into the, 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 the nuances of, of this doctrine. But he's just using this as an illustration saying, you know, once the husband's dead, once she becomes a widow, great, go ahead. You know, that law, that's, that's done. Until death was part, okay, it's completed. Now you're free to get married again to whoever you want. And he's explaining that and illustrating that saying, okay, you are dead to the law, the law of God by the body of Christ because Christ freed you from that law. When Christ paid the penalty of the law for your sins, you're no longer bound by that. Christ has freed you from that. He says that you should 
be married to another. So the purpose is, hey, he freed you from that. From you, you, you were married to this, to this law that brings death because you're a sinner. And you deserve, the, you know, you're headed straight into hell. Hey, Christ came and paid that for you. He fulfilled that, that you should be married now to him. That you should be married to him and, and to do the good works and, and bring forth fruit unto God. He's saying that's what you want to hear. Hey, now you're married to, to, to Jesus. He's saying now you need to be doing good and being a good, a good spouse, if you will, in the, in the light of this illustration, right? Verse number five. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And again, notice the words should. And that's why I'm you know, pointing out the words. You know, would versus should versus must. Right? Should is something you should do. It's things that this is what you're supposed to do. It doesn't mean it's an automatic that you are going to do it no matter what. But you should. Right? The Bible says, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in all thy house. Right? That's what you must do. Here it's saying, once you're you know, delivered from the law, what should you do? You should walk in newness of spirit. Amen and amen. Of course we should. But it doesn't mean you're always going to. And see, this is the key. A lot of people get this confused. You say, well, that person says they're saved, but they're still drinking. This person says they're saved, and they're still doing this or doing that. Well, they should be walking in the newness of spirit. That's right. They should. They should be giving that stuff up. They should be turning from those sins. They should be doing what's right. Yes, they should. But it doesn't say that they are, they're automatically just going to do that. Verse number seven, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Now look at this in verse 9, because this is an important note too I want to make. He says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. He says he was alive without the law once. See, the, the reason why we deserve any punishment at all is because there is a law. God laid down a law. He gave us, you know, told us not to kill, not to steal, not, you know, all these different things. When we break the law, we become a transgressor of the law. And that's why we need to be born again. That's why we need that punishment paid for us. But what he's explaining here is that there was a time in the Apostle Paul's life. Now, he was born after the law of God was given. Right? So he's not talking about some time period before the law of Moses or something like that. No, he says, I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And this is, this, I believe this firmly, and I believe the Bible teaches this, that there comes a point in our life from the time of birth up to a certain point where we reach an age of understanding or an age of responsibility or accountability, whatever you want to call it, that any child, any infant, anyone, any child that dies in the womb, they go straight to heaven because they're not sinners. Because they're alive. They were alive without the law. They don't know, they have no idea, no concept of the law. They don't even understand anything about it. They can't do right or wrong. They're not going to be held to the, to the accountability of the law when they have no concept of it whatsoever. It's when the law, when the commandment comes, that's when you have the opportunity to, to break the commandment, sin revived and I died. And it's the same way, you know, the Bible teaches this going all the way back to Genesis. In the Garden of Eden, he told Adam and Eve, of all the trees of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you may not eat. And for in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Right? That's what he told them. He says, the day that you eat of that tree, you are going to die. Now, did Adam and Eve eat of that tree? Yes, they did. Did they die? Yes, they did. Did they die physically? No. They didn't just fall down dead on that day. They were still alive talking to God. They had to die because God said that they would surely die. Yep. 
He didn't change that at all. What happened? Their spirit died. They were alive once without the law. The law they had a real easy law. <laughs> Dude, they had one, one commandment in that law. Don't eat of that tree. The commandment came. Sin revived and they died when they broke that commandment. That was their sin. They transgressed. They broke that law. They died. Anybody, everybody is born or is created alive with a, a live spirit. Once they, you know, and, and, I, and I don't know when this happened in an individual. God knows when that is. When someone gets to a, a point where they can comprehend things enough to know what sin is, to know, you know, to understand the law, at least in some rudimentary sense of right and wrong, then that's when you become a sinner. That's when your spirit dies, and that's when you need to be born again. That's when you need that new life. He said, without the law, sin was dead. Uh, verse number 10, let's keep reading. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. And see, the commandments, God's commandments are good for us. The commandments are unto life. You, you keep all the commandments, that's great. I mean, that's, Jesus Christ did it, right? And they were good. They were ordained to life. But I found to be unto death. Why? Because he broke them. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, so he's not blaming the law. He's not saying like the, the law is not bad, the law is not sin, the law is not evil, the law is the law. He says the law is actually good. The law is something that's good for us to follow, but see, the sin deceived me. Sin comes in and says, hey, you know what? This is actually more fun. Hey, you should actually do it. Hey, that's not that big of a deal. Yea, hath God said that you shall surely die? Hmm? Satan deceiving. Isn't, isn't this a good tree? Hey, he knows that when you eat that, you're going to be like God's. You're going to know all this stuff. Let's see, it's a good tree. And sin deceived him. And by it, slew him. And that's what happens with us. Whatever the case may be. Hey, I could get away with this if I just tell a lie. Did you do this? No, I, I didn't do that. It's a deception. Thinking that you're going to get away with stuff, but you're not. You tell a lie, you might get away with it for a little amount of time, but you're never going to get away with it for, with, from God. God sees everything. God knows everything. Uh, let's keep reading here. Verse 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am carnal, sold under sin. And again, this is the Apostle Paul. He saved, he's writing this letter to the Romans later in his life. And he right here is saying that I am carnal, sold under sin. The born again believer saying I am carnal. Verse 15, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, and again, there's that word would. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. He's saying, I'm going to go through this slowly because it's kind of, it can be tricky if you, if you don't slow down a little bit. Verse 15, for that which I do, I allow not. He's saying, I'm doing things that I don't want to do. The things that I don't, I have rules for myself. I don't allow this. I don't allow that. You know, he doesn't allow sin in his life, right? But he still ends up doing them. For what I would, the things I want to do, he says, I'm not doing that. I mean, how many, how many of you people think, man, you know, I really want to read the Bible. Man, I know I need to pray. I know I need to do this. All these great things you know you want to do. And you really want to do them in your heart. And you, you know, you know your heart. Your heart's saying, man, I really want to do all these things. And then, like, maybe you have a whole day plan. You say, man, I'm going to do this. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to do this. And then at the end of the day, you look back and you're like, what did I do? Right. What, how, how did I not do these things? I mean, I want, this is what I wanted to do with my day. What happened? This is what he's talking about. But that, what I hate, that do I. So I'm doing the things I hate. I didn't want to do it all. I ended up doing that. If then I do that, which I would not, he's saying, if I end up doing the things that I didn't want to do, hey, the law is still good. 
It's, it's not the law's fault that I screwed up. It's not the law's fault that I'm walking in the flesh. The law is still good. Verse 17, 17, now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, and he clarifies, that is, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. He's saying, as long as I'm in this flesh, this flesh has no good. There is no goodness at all to our flesh. And he's saying, it's not me. He's saying, this flesh isn't me. This isn't what, who I am. This isn't what I want to do. But the flesh is driving me. This sin that's dwelling in me is preventing me from doing all the things that I want to do. For the good, verse 19, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, the things I don't want to do, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He stated that sentence twice. He says, not me. So when you're considering whether or not a person's going to go to heaven or hell, when they're born again, you've got the Spirit of God inside of you. You're born of the incorruptible seed in your spirit. This flesh is sinful. This flesh dwells in us and when we sin, it's a result of that flesh, not of your spirit. So when you die physically, what happens? Your body falls down on the ground or is laying, you know, we bury the body in the ground. This sinful flesh now has been removed. Your soul and spirit now is what's left. The spirit is not what's sinning. The spirit is what always wants to do good. It's no longer I that sin, but the sin that dwells in you know, is this flesh. Once that flesh is removed, you still are left with the incorruptible life that was brought forth from the incorruptible seed. And when that, that, the, the, the flesh is dead, the spirit soul go to heaven because there is no more sin at all a part of you who you are. Let's keep reading here. I'll finish this off and then we're going to go to 1 John chapter 3 and, and, and wrap it up. Uh, verse 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And that's what I like, the law of God, the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He said, I'm sick of the body of this death. God, please deliver me from this body. I'm sick of sinning. I'm sick of being in this condition. I don't want this anymore. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God but with the flesh the law of sin. It's a daily battle, a daily struggle. Sometimes people are losing this battle to the flesh. It doesn't make them unsaved. Right. If they have the Spirit of God because they put their faith in Christ then they're His. They've been redeemed. It's incorruptible. You cannot corrupt. You can't taint that. No sin could get in and, and corrupt that spirit. Can't happen. But you still have this flesh. And this flesh is going to drive us to do what's not right. Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 3, all the way near the end of the Bible. Again, if you're going backwards from Revelation, you're going to have Revelation, then the book of Jude, then 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. 1 John chapter 3, this passage sometimes causes troubles with new believers because... You have to understand the whole, just the way things work. And, and you know, it's not a difficult concept. It is a mystery, but it's not a difficult concept. But you do have to have knowledge of, you know, the entire Bible pretty much to kind of put all this stuff together. And, um, well, just to start off, in, in, verse, in chapter number 1, see, the, the, before we even get to chapter 3, chapter number 1, verses 8, 9, and 10, we start, the, the Apostle John starts off his letter making this clear. Look at verses 8, 9, 10 of chapter 1. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. He's being real clear right off the bat, saying, look, we're sinners. We can't say that we're without sin, you know, all this stuff. Because ultimately, we are accountable for our sin. And that's what the Apostle Paul was saying in the book of Romans, too. He, was, he wasn't saying he wasn't accountable for it, because he says the law is still good. But what he's saying is that that's not what he wants to do. That's not the inward man talking there. That's the flesh. And he's making that distinction. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7.20, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. We're all sinners. And we're sinning, even after you're saved, you, know, you still commit sin. But what we're going to see here in 1 John chapter 3, he's going to go on to explain in a little bit more detail the inward man. That new creature, what Paul was explaining in Romans 7. Look at uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse number 4. Where we're going to start reading here. Verse number 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. There's our definition of sin. It's when you break God's law. Verse 5. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Christ had no sins. He, was, he came, he was manifested in the flesh in order to take our sins away. Whosoever abideth in him, look at this, verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him, sinneth not. If you live in Christ, if you abide in Christ, you sin not. Whosoever sinneth, hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Look at verse number 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Doth not commit sin. You say, well, wait a minute, I sin. Does that mean I'm not born of God? I could keep reading the verse. For, why? Why does he not commit sin? For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Amen. It's the Spirit that is born of the seed, of the incorruptible seed. Right. That spirit cannot sin. Amen. And that's what he's saying right here. It cannot sin. Be why? Because it's born of God. Because you have, just as with your, your parents, when you're born of your parents, there's that DNA mesh, right? Your mother and your father, that DNA comes together and, and comprises it, makes up who you are. When you've got the incorruptible word of God as the seed, Bringing forth that new spirit? There's no corruption there. There's no mutated genes in there. There's no deformations. There's nothing wrong. It's pure. It's clean. It's of God. And that spirit is your inward man that always is going to do what's right. Always. That's why the Bible is constantly telling us, walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. There's a battle going on. Walk in that spirit. That new spirit never sins. That new spirit is what you receive when you get saved. So no matter what sins you do in your flesh, the spirit is incorruptible. The spirit is, is what's end, ending up in heaven until the day that Christ comes back and this mortal, corruptible, wicked flesh that we have is converted and changed. And you get this brand new body in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. And we're going to be brought... See, what, when you die, you're, you're in a spirit world. You're going to be just in, in a spirit form, which is interesting in and of itself. I mean, what is that going to be like? I don't know. What do our forms look like? Do we look like exactly our bodies, just in a spirit? I don't know what it looks like, but I know that it's only going to be temporary until the day that we're reunited with our bodies, but the body now is going to be immortal and incorruptible, just like our spirit is. And we're going to be back in the flesh, but not the wicked, corruptible flesh, an incorruptible flesh. And that, is, that will be the completion of our salvation that God is going to bring for us. It's going to happen. There's no, there's no change. Once you're born again, once you put your faith in Christ, that is the course of events and nothing's going to change that. You can't give up your salvation. That's it. I mean, you're, you've already, what God's already started that good work in you, He's going to perform it until the day of Christ. It's going to happen. He's put the earnest down. You've got it. Praise the Lord for that. This is the good news. This is great news. 
And this illustrates and demonstrates truly and completely how much love God actually has for you. To make salvation it couldn't be any freer, it couldn't be any simpler. He says, Christ did all the work. Put your faith on Him. That's it. You're saved. Now, He expects you to do good things. He expects you to follow Him. He expects you to be a good child. He expects you to be obedient. I mean, He's your Father. He wants you to do, you know, walk in His steps and do what He wants you to do. But He's your Father. And He's never going to leave you or forsake you. He's never going to cast you out. And He's separated your sins from you as far as the east is from the west. Praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your wonderful gift. God, we thank you for giving us eternal life. God, I pray that if there was any uh, confusion prior to this service, dear Lord, that, that, that people would have a better understanding of, of the new man, the new creature, the new spirit, dear Lord, that cannot sin, that you said cannot sin, and that, uh, and that we believe. We believe your words, dear Lord. We believe that uh, our bodies is go are going to be changed at the, at the resurrection, dear Lord, when Jesus Christ comes back, and we pray that you would please just uh, help us in the meantime, while we still do have this flesh, I pray that you please help us to strengthen our spirit, that we're continuing to walk in the spirit more often and, and mortifying, killing the deeds of our flesh and making our flesh weaker and weaker and weaker so that it has less and less control over us, dear Lord, that we could do the things that we actually want to do, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.